Hi everyone, welcome and or welcome back to the podcast 123 Eyes on Me. For those who haven't been here before, here we talk about all things education, what's working, what's not, and ways to improve the system. The goal here is very simple, help the kids succeed. My name is Aaron, aka Mr. Jackson, and today we have a special guest, school board member Diane Bellamy Small. Diane, thanks for being here. Tell us about yourself. My name is T. Diane Bellamy Small, and I serve as the District 1 Guilford County School Board representative. I have been on the board since 2016. I have also been a teacher. I'm a storyteller so and a trainer, so, you know, experience in developing curriculum and, you know, being in leadership. Sounds good. Thanks for that. All right, so we're going to play a little game here called One for One. I'm going to say one word, and then I'd like you to say one that comes to mind. I have a total of four words. You ready? Yes. All right. The first word is school. Education. Second one is students. Future. The third one is money. (laughs) Power. Good. And then the last one is time. Not a lot of it. I know that's not one word. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're fine. So with money, you said power. So this was the first. I definitely agree with this one very strongly, actually. Not necessarily a good thing, in my opinion. Can you expand on what you meant by power? Well, education is very closely tied to economic development, because in order to grow your commerce in an area, you have got to have an educated workforce. Well, the primary place to get that is in your public schools. There has to be a willingness by the capitalists to want to spend money to educate the workforce. We know through history that there have been moves not to educate a workforce, because if you didn't educate them, then you could keep them in low paying, you know, very difficult kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. But in the 21st century, we are wanting a workforce that can do, you know, high tech and opportunities for higher paid jobs. So money is important to spend it to give a high quality of education for our workforce or our students, if that's what you want to call them. But eventually what you are hoping they will become is your workforce. I like how you put that. If a company does not spend their money wisely, especially on, you know, as you said, the workforce or their employees, their expertise may be growing, but if they're the same position, things are going to be very stagnant and they won't be able to progress. And then, as you said, students from the future, if everything is stagnant across the board, how are they going to expand? Really good. When it comes to your teaching and administrative experience in the school system, I know you touched on it. Out of all of these positions, which one was your favorite that you resided with the most? Well, at one point, I was a teacher for the community college, and I taught GED. And for me, that was a very rewarding experience because here were adults who were going back and trying to recapture some of them. I had students who were as old as in their 50s, but they were going back and trying to recapture what they didn't get in public in their public high school education, either because they dropped out Mm -hmm. or, as I found, a lot of my students were missing some of the learning blocks. So whenever you have a a 25-year-old who does not understand how to do long division or who does not know the difference between a a verb and a noun Mm -hmm. and and its relationship, which means that then that hinders their ability to communicate, I was able to work with these students holistically because whether they are adult students or whether they are a child, you cannot just segregate the brain from the body Mm -hmm. or from the environment. You have to figure out a way to understand how to help a student become a whole person, because if they if they feel good about themselves and if they believe that they are are capable of of learning and and acquiring knowledge, then they're going to be more productive and they're going to pass that on to whether it's their own children or in the community. I like how you took the initiative to continue to teach after or those who I guess were seen as lower than the standard or those who didn't have that opportunity for whatever reason. I like how you took it a step further and you were actually one of those educators who said, no, these people are also the future or they are, you know, adults now, but they still need the essentials, you know, to have a decent paying job. And even apart from the job, just their education in general. When people have 
limited education, they don't feel empowered. They don't feel that they have the same rights as somebody who has a high school diploma or, or a degree. And so with my students, my, my mantra has always been to inform, empower, and engage. So helping these students understand how to communicate, helping them understand how to make critical decisions. If you, if you were 25 years old or 40 years old and never felt that you had a voice, but all of a sudden because of a teacher or because someone took the time to, to show you how to write a letter, to defend your position on, on your job, or to be able to express whenever you were not being treated fairly on your job. That empowers people not to let other folk take advantage of them because of a lack of education. As I mentioned to a friend in the past, school is more than just, you know, working toward a career. Education is very important within itself. And you just touched on one of those prime examples. There's self-worth. I like that a lot. So the next question I have for you is, within the education system, what is one thing that you really enjoy doing and that you can even see yourself doing for free? Well, I already do it for free, and that's to be able to be around our children whenever I, or, or young people, because we, 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 those of us who've already, you know, gone, you know, like me, who are, who are like, I'm, I'm, I'm a servant leader, I'm, I'm an elected official, mm -hmm. but a lot of times we do not submerge ourselves in around the people that we we say we represent. So to be able to go, as I told you, I'm a storyteller, I'm, or actually I'm called a song teller. So to be able to go to a school and do a Black history program where I involve all the students, like for instance, in 2020, the Black history theme was on Blacks in, in voting. And so I actually did an activity with the students to deny them their vote. And if you would have seen the way those third graders reacted whenever their vote was thrown in the trash, mm -hmm. and I helped them understand that this is what it means to not be able to vote and, and, and the, the emotion that these kids felt. And I asked them, I said, how do you feel? And they said, well, I, I feel angry. But, you know, that's not fair. And I said, okay, but see, I'm talking to a, somebody who's eight years old. So you think about it, if that impression stays with that child until he is 18 or until he becomes an adult, he will be more, he or she will be more likely to uh, not tolerate those kinds of, of uh, discriminatory practices. But you got to, got to, you know, go and show kids. Plus, when children see someone who looks like them, who will sing to them, talk to them, uh, share stories with them. It, it does something for them to encourage them that I can be that, I can do that. How many times have we had children who did not aspire to be something because they didn't see someone like them doing it? Mm -hmm. Me being an ex educator for the public system, I still educate, but not for the system. I've been told by an administrators and teachers, it's very important that we have a lot of African-American male teachers in the system, especially males in general over women, not to say that the female was not needed, but more males were needed. And I definitely agree with this because when you have a lot of African-American students in general, they see another figure who's very successful. You don't see what you see on the news or, you know, viral videos online and they're making a positive impact that will definitely change their mindset. And earlier when you were speaking of when you went into the schools, the third graders, you said specifically, how you had an experiment with them where their vote didn't count. It instantly took me back to Jane Elliott's you know, race experiment about the blue versus brown eyes. But we don't hear, or at least I haven't heard of many examples after her who have done this. <laughs> so I'm glad that you have done this. A lot is demanded uh, of our public schools, but at the same time, our public schools uh, aren't necessarily equipped to handle all of the demands. Mm. Uh, I was at a, at a meeting yesterday where they were, had two ex-offenders there who were, who've changed their lives and they're trying to do, you know, to change the, you know, the lives of young people in the community. And mm -hmm. they said, well, we want to go into public schools and we want the, the teachers to see who we really are and that we can change things. And I said, well, your problem with that is that at least in Guilford County, we have our schools have, are 70, almost 70% black and brown children, but our teaching workforce is 80% white female. I've made it my business that whenever I'm asked to come to a school, I'd like to go other than just in Black History Month because I am African-American the other 11 months too. 
Mm. I went over and I took a fact sheet that talked about Martin Luther King as a child, talked about him, you know, and what he grew up with and, and him going to college and things other things. Because all those kids knew was I have a dream. And I'm mm. like, no, there was much, much more yes. <laughs> to this particular icon than I have a dream. So, you know, I wound up, you know, I was supposed to be in the classroom for 45 minutes and I wound up, you know, going overtime because these kids really didn't know that there was more to Dr. Martin Luther King than, than I have a dream. And it's important for us to, to talk about the whole history and not just give a portion of it. It's just like I, I did a Juneteenth program for the city of Greensboro last year. And I didn't start on June the 19th. I started in 1861 because, I, you know, it's important that you know, why do we even have Juneteenth? Mm -hmm. If you didn't know what happened as far as the, the, you know, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War and all of the steps that led up to that, mm -hmm. how can you talk about Juneteenth? Sounds like one of the main issues that you're trying to resolve, and there are many issues, is, you know, just the uh, enlightening, enlightening, if you will, of different races, especially the African-American race. Because as you mentioned, you went overtime. A lot of those students had no idea who Martin Luther King was. And this goes for a lot of African-American leaders, if you will, or those, you know, trying to make effective change. Going into this next point that I have, when it comes to the education system in general, there are a lot of things that are working and then a lot of things that aren't. Personally speaking, I believe the main two issues are parent involvement, which I know you've been a part of, developing programs and such. And then another one is there are a lot of issues that everyone wants to try to attack from different angles. And I think that's a main issue because we're not all on the same page. One, in terms of communication, and then two, in terms of how do we go about solving this issue? Well, parent involvement, that has, you have got to start uh, getting parents to understand that their involvement starts at birth. It doesn't start when that kid gets into kindergarten. Yes. When I used to work for the housing authority, I actually got the schools to come to the public housing communities because that was what, what the parents were familiar with. And, I, and, and the parents were more uh, easy to engage with if you came to my house first before I came to the schoolhouse. And so you, you, you got to figure out ways to make it a two-way street. Um, exactly. You'll find that some schools that do have better parent involvement, particularly in your, uh, your poorer communities, it's because they go uh, uh, into those communities, and they should. <laughs> There's so much here uh, <laughs> with what we've been saying. This is getting good. I love it. It's not only about prioritizing issues, but now we need to figure out what those issues are and what are people's real motives underneath what they're trying to and not trying to pass. Economic depravity, it still exists. Okay, so as I told the group yesterday, you need to look at, though we are able to elect African-Americans to serve on boards and, and to be elected, you need to get folks to question the racist policies. Mm. For example, Title I. Okay, we had a conversation where uh, with Title I monies, we are putting uh, mental health in our Title I schools. But yet some of the most egregious things like the, the school shootings, those have not been mm -hmm. uh, poor black kids or poor brown kids who committed those atrocities. But, you know, and I'm not saying that mental health is not needed in our Title I schools, but some of the, some, the things like, like school violence, the fact that, that Guilford County is going to spend over almost three quarters of a million dollars to provide the scanners in the next school year mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, to try to prevent guns from coming to school to, to the, you know, that kind of violence. But if we look nationally, it has not been black mm -hmm. kids and um, poor right. black kids who have been doing mass shoot. But you're going to put mental health only in the Title I poor schools? Mm -hmm. The Title I schools are primarily black and brown kids? Okay. And racial discrimination is an issue. A lot of younger white kids are seeing more of, I don't want to say the traits or anything, because that's just kind of a stereotype, but they're seeing more of different sides of African-American people that they haven't seen before, based on, you know, contrary to what their parents may have told them. I had a student that, again, going back to my, my GED days, that they kicked him off of main campus. I was an off-site, and they sent him to me. Now, I can tell you, Steve, he, 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 he tried my last nerve. 
So because he was so so just active and and you know he he wouldn't sit still and this was a, this was an adult this was not a child and every time I turn around I would have to say stop 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 so finally one day I said I need to figure out what the heck is wrong with this young man so I gave him the uh, pre GED test he made a perfect score he was one of my few students right boarding class <laughs> yeah he made a perfect <laughs> score. The school system should not be looking at race, but sadly they are. So what would you change in terms of giving everyone the equal opportunity? Well, I, I think one is that you've got to deal with, with who's making the policies. Because, see, um, you've got people in Raleigh. The, uh, we, we need to give more local control, in my opinion, back to your public schools to make the decision on what's best for education for our schools. Now, in doing that, though, Every system is not necessarily going to be uh, fair and do right by their students. So does there need to be some oversight? Yes. But that oversight should be the, the community and the parents asking the questions. And, and, and uh, but then you, you, you got to be in this climate that we're in now. You have folks who want public schools not to teach uh, uh, history. <laughs> I didn't say African-American history. I said history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. They, don't, they want you to... to, to uh, uh, you know, say that slavery was a good thing. I mean, I remember when my child came home in fifth grade, and he's now 45 years old, and in his book it said that 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 the the plantation was just this big farm that everybody worked happily together no. on. And I almost oh my lost goodness. my mind going into that school. Uh, so, and this was in his textbook. Mm -hmm. I remember one school I went to, a middle school, when I came back the second day and I was signing in, even the secretarial staff looked at me and said, you came back. And I just looked at them like, uh, yeah, you know, because again, it's how you treat children and people. If you treat them with, if you, if I expect you to be a thug, you're going to be a thug. If I expect you to be a gentleman, you will be a gentleman. Even if you don't quite understand the, the concept, it's, you're going to take your cues off of me. I have been asked, like I told you, uh, for Martin Luther King Day, mm -hmm. this one uh, uh, middle school here in Guilford County wanted us to come out there. And uh, my instruction to those children was that, you know, I, I asked them how old they were. So your third graders were seven, eight-year-olds. Uh, your uh, fifth graders were 10 years. So I told them, I said, in eight years, you need to go and register to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't think that what I did in that one day in some way, it may not impress all of them, but somebody, the seed was planted. Okay? Definitely. You know, so, so that's, and that's, and, and I say this to you because that's how I feel school should be. That's how school was for me. Uh, I became a singer because of a teacher. I wrote a book about it, uh, uh, but I will teach you. And, and it tells how the love of the teacher, the love of music, and the fact that when I went to her and asked her, I wanted to do solos. She looked at me and said, you don't have the voice. And I thought the conversation was over with. And then she looked at me through her trifocals and said, but I will teach you. And I became a singer because of that. That's beautiful. Honestly, I feel like that's, that's honestly the best way to end this podcast because you just said it yourself. If we have someone who will take the time to look past what they may not like to help someone, that's how we're going to move forward. I love that. I think that's really good. My very last question actually is... Um, <laughs> Less, less of condensing, not really condensing it. You can condense it if you want, but what would you say to the listeners out here in terms of word of encouragement or any advice going forward? With my mantra, be informed, be empowered and engage. I like that, it's really good. All right, well, everyone, <laughs> that was there was so much there. I wish we could talk longer, but that's a wrap for today. Thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned for the next episodes coming out. Diane, thanks again for your words of wisdom. It was very much needed in today's society. So thank you. You're welcome. My honor. All right. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you and take care. You too.